Church, parts one and two of the Janet documentary premiered last night. And while I can't say that there were a lot of grand revelations, I did walk away with a lot of grand observations. I got my notes, I hope y'all got yours. Let's get on into this one. Right now y'all so first off I really just want to commend Janet Jackson for doing this in the first place it takes a lot to be vulnerable and tell your own story but there's also um, an element of pride to it and being able to tell your story in your own words no one can tell your story better than you and I think in the age that we are in where our legends are you know dying away without telling their own stories and then you have all of these biographies or you know tales from the people peripheral to them or people that are not even peripheral to them the unauthorized biographies um i think that there is something to be said of telling your own story from your own perspective in your own words so good for janet now um just like i said in the intro i didn't think that there were a lot of grand revelations in this um in these first two parts but what I did glean from them is sort of a framework for how the story is going to be told. You know, when you're building a house, you start with the framing of it. And I think that's what this was. It was setting the stage to understand how Janet became Janet. You know, the rise, the fall, the rise again, the scandals, etc. So a very, very great framing job, um, I thought, in this first um, in these first two parts. So let's start out talking about Joe Jackson. Um, I wrote down that Joe Jackson was the reason for it all. I really feel that he was. He was a flawed man, but he did right by his children. Um, I really wanna talk about it in three main, three main um, notes that I wrote down. So let's just talk about first his vision, right? Joe Jackson and Katherine Jackson raised nine kids in Gary, Indiana, right? With murderers, drug dealers, people doing crime, all sorts of stuff going on, okay? And the fact that Joe saw in his children that they had talent that he could foster that could get them out of their circumstance, you have to really just marvel at the vision of it all, right? Um, Tyler Perry has a quote that I always keep um, near and dear to my heart, which is, never be afraid of small beginnings. And that was a small beginning like no other. When you have your neighbor saying, you know, keep all that racket down y'all ain't going nowhere y'all just you know doing making all this noise and stuff and he saw the bigger picture and always takes one person to have the vision of grandeur right so let this be a lesson to any of you if you have a dream that's in your heart something that's been placed on your spirit don't be afraid to go after it and don't let anybody stop you now on the second aspect of joe jackson i just want to talk about um, the notion of being happy versus being great. I think that they did a good job in the documentary of showing the duality of Joe Jackson, right? Or maybe the lack of duality is what it was. So in order to make his children great, he had to make a decision. And they framed it in the documentary as him giving up his parenthood to become sort of the manager, right? Um, I don't think, you know, some parents that have children in show business can do it both in terms of being like the momager or the dadager but um joe jackson needed to make the distinction because he had a vision and in his vision you know it, it wasn't this loving vision he had love for his children but it was more so that he saw the potential in them to be great and to you know to triumph over their circumstances and in order to do that there had to be a separation between the loving father and the, the the determined manager. And I think he chose the latter. Now there's a saying that you can either be happy or you can be great. Now Joe Jackson chose greatness for his children. Um, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, it's said that the Jackson children didn't have childhoods, right? Um, I think when you achieve that level of super stardom or just stardom because, you know, all the children have varying levels of stardom, you have to make some sort of concession in life, right? You cannot have it all. Michelle Obama says you can have it all, but not at the same time. And she was speaking to women, but I think we can definitely um, relay it to this general circumstance here, right? You can have it all, but not at the same time. You can either be happy or you can be great, but you couldn't do both at the same time. Perhaps you can, you know, get those later on in life, but 
in order to get out of their circumstance, they had to choose being great and he chose it for them. Um, it does suck though, because, you know, they were sort of robbed of an experience in terms of like their childhood and the love from their father, but in exchange, they got super stardom and, um, you know, money and fame. So one could say it balances out. One could say, you know, they got a sh the short end of the stick, but I, I don't know. I feel that sometimes once you achieve that level of stardom, fame, et cetera, you can work on being happy later, baby. That's what therapy is for. That's why I'm in therapy every Thursday, baby, just to figure out how I can balance trying to be great and be happy at the same time, you know? So um, I definitely identified with wanting to get yourself out of a circumstance and put yourself on a greater plane of life. And I think that's really what Joe Jackson wanted for his children. Now, they didn't really go much into the discipline aspect of it. Um, you know, they lightly went into it. And I didn't think they really had to talk about the intricacies of it because we've known it so much just in terms of popular culture and um, the stories that have been told by the Jacksons in, in the past. But um, in my opinion, Joe Jackson's discipline was really overkill to scare them straight, right? I said before that they grew up in Gary, Indiana with murderers, people doing crime, drug dealers, etc. And so I think that Joe Jackson's goal was to make his children so disciplined and so scared of him that they weren't willing to even attempt to 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 deal in any crazy stuff that was happening outside of the house, right? I'm going to scare you to the point that that stuff is not even an option for you and you don't even think about it. So really, I really feel that it was overkill to scare them straight. And listen, it worked. Um, I'm not saying that his methods were correct. I'm sure that by today's standards, it's probably a form of abuse and whatnot, but it was a different time back then, right? And in order to get his children to the vision that he had for them, they had to have some sort of baseline of discipline, hard work, practicing, and being able to see the forest for the trees, right? So, you know, y'all may disagree, but um, I don't I don't agree with his total methods, but I agree with the long-term goal of it and where he ended up putting them. Um, so like I said, you can be happy or you can be great, but you can't do both at the same time. Now, moving forward to a little tidbit that they really dropped in the middle of the thing, but they didn't really talk much about it, but they said, David Bowie offered Michael and Randy drugs. Now, listen, I am not going to spend much time on this because I don't really believe that there's a story here. Um, but what I will say is a uh, recreational drug use was very rampant in the 70s. And so it was a different time, just like the discipline was a different time. The drug use was a different time. So growing up in the entertainment sphere, not even in the entertainment sphere, it was recreational drug use was just rampant, right? And I'm sure it was more rampant among the people that had the means to do more of it, right? So I don't think it was anything, you know, out of the ordinary for David Bowie to be doing drugs or whatever, um, or to offer it to them, right? Because I don't know exactly how old they were at the time. I'm assuming young adults. I don't think he would offer it to them if they were minors, but um, it probably was just a, a byproduct of the business at that time. But as I said, because Joe Jackson had instilled such a level of discipline into them, they wanted no parts of it. Now, y'all may say later on in life, Michael ended up, you know, with the, the drugs and the propofol and blah, blah, blah. That's another story for another day. And we're in the Janet documentary. So stay on message. <laughs> Move it on. Now, I did know that Janet was born into the wealth. Um, she didn't seem to remember the struggle as much. So if y'all will recall in the beginning of the documentary, they went back to Gary, Indiana, to the actual house that they grew up on, um, on Jackson Street. And um, I think it was pivotal to have Randy there with Janet, because when I say that she she was born into the wealth, Janet was born into the Gary, Indiana house, right? What I'm saying is, is that she doesn't have a real memory of those times, right? By the time that she was seven, they were already living in Encino, doing shows weekly at um, in Las Vegas and stuff. So her actual memories of her childhood are really in 
California in the family business, et cetera. And she didn't really remember the upbringing in Gary in terms of how it all started. So I thought having Randy there was really, really great just to add a baseline in terms of telling her where she came from um, and showing her the stories and the intricacies that she didn't have because she was so young when they were at that house. Um, moving forward, she was dragged into the family business. She actually wanted to go to college and study business law. I don't have any problems with this. I think sometimes you can have a vision for yourself, but because someone has a larger vision for you, that takes precedence. Um, Joe Jackson is such a domineering figure that I can't see him ever letting Janet or allowing her to go to college to study business law because he saw something greater for all of them, right? And so that vision thing is really something that propelled the family to superstardom. And it's something, it's like a, it's like a interweaving thread throughout the whole story. Now, um, I, I don't have any problems with her being dragged into the family business. It's like, listen, your eight other siblings are tootsie rolling on stage, okay, with tambourines and singing for the people. Girl, you better grab this boa, this microphone, and this sparkly dress and entertain the people. <laughs> like, I don't think... I, some people are just destined for that star, that star life, that star quality, you know, that essence, whatever it is. And she had it. And I think Joe saw it in her and to allow her to um, just live in an ordinary life. And I'm not downing ordinary lives. So people who have become doctors, lawyers, nurses and whatever, more power to you. I'm just saying that sometimes there's a calling over certain people's lives. And I think Janet would have done a disservice to herself by not following that path that was clearly already laid out for her. But it is sort of the beginning of the elements of control in her story, right? In terms of not being able to select her own path, not really having a say. Um, the, the, the interweaving thread sort of starts there, you know, with Joe Jackson's vision and also the elements of control there. So I thought that was really, really interesting. Now, um, what I did find interesting and sort of like a revelation was that Janet's singing career was her father's pet project after the brothers fired him. I did not know that. You know, I knew from the um, Jackson 5 and the Michael Jackson documentaries that at some point in time, they, they moved away from Joe Jackson as their manager. They had to sever ties in order to become who they wanted to be, right? I just didn't realize that after Joe Jackson was fired from that aspect, Janet and Janet's career became his main focus, right? And it almost seems like a sense of uh, a passion project, but also a mad project, right? Like, y'all gonna fire me? I'll show you. I'm gonna take Janet, who already has talent over here, and I'm gonna foster it. I'm gonna make her bigger than all of y'all. So I think it was really um, not only his pet project, but also his second act in terms of having another chance to 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 get back on, to 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 foster his managerial capacities in a way to benefit his children, to benefit his legacy, to benefit his family, right? Because the Jacksons, they didn't really have, they had love, like there was love there. You know, you don't do all of these things for your children. You don't propel them to this level of success because you don't love them, right? So there was love there, but it was more so a managerial love from the father and um, wanting them to be successful because that reflected upon him, in my opinion. So um, like I said, the interweaving thread of control because he didn't have control over the boys anymore. Now he exercised his control over Janet. Now the music didn't do well. Um, and so she wanted out of her father's control. And to me, that's really indicative sometimes of when people pick paths for you, but you're not really 100% on board with it, right? There was a line in the Aretha Franklin movie, Respect, where I think, I forget the singer's name who was talking to Aretha, but she said, until you do the things that you're passionate about, you're not going anywhere. And I think that that's what this really represents. You know, we can have a vision for you. We can push you out there. We can put you with the best producers. But if you're not really feeling it yourself and it's not authentically coming from you, you're not going anywhere. And I think that was the... um the explanation and the effect of Janet's earlier music, right? So in order to exercise her control or to get out of her father's control, she chose to get married um, to James DeBarge. Now, what I found interesting was that the first marriage to James DeBarge seemed to be a marriage of convenience, right? And I say convenience um, not to minimize the fact that there was love there and care there and there was a commonality in terms of shared experiences 
in terms of show business families um, and that they knew each other for years. So there was already a commonality there. There was already, you know, a love there. I don't know if it was puppy love or actual love um, or just love fostered because it was a way out of what you had always known, right? But her form of exercise and control was to try to run from one man to another, right? And she felt that if she got married, at least she wouldn't have to answer to her father anymore. You know, she'd now have this husband that would sort of protect her from the father's side. Now, what I always find interesting sometimes is that when we try to run from our problems, we end up finding more problems, um, which is not always the case. But often, more often than not, when you're running from one set of problems, sometimes you can end up in a whole new set of problems that you didn't even realize were coming. So James DeBarge actually turned out to be a drug addict. Um, and so she was propelled into the life of trying to care for this husband that had this substance abuse problem, you know, searching the streets, trying to find him, trying to get him help, X, Y, Z. And what was interesting is that this period in her life that had such a pivotal impact on her in terms of emotionally was only a year. I didn't realize that at all. So I thought that was very, very um, interesting that she had that level of growth and that level of exposure to the world and the world's problems in that single year of that marriage that later became annulled. Um, unfortunately, sometimes your expectations for situations don't turn out. Um, and Janet said it started to create a pattern that she was attracted to projects, right? And she sort of framed it in the way it was, you know, I was attracted to people that ended up doing drugs, right? She has a spirit over her that wants to help, right? A helpful spirit, a spirit that wants to fix it, um, to fix it for somebody else. And so she tried, but listen, when you're young and you're in love um, or you're in what you think is love and your, your motives for the actual marriage were actually just to get out of your father's control, it can really seem overwhelming, which is why I think that she got the marriage annulled and she had to get out. It was out of her realm of knowledge. It was out of her realm of comfortability. Um, they didn't grow up in that way. They, they were taught and they were disciplined to stay away from drugs. So the fact that she ended up married to a person who did drugs probably sent her for a, a definite loop. Now onto the matter of this secret DeBarge baby. Um, I am definitely 100% on Team Janet. I don't believe that there was ever a baby. I think that this was a creation of a salacious media cycle that um, unfortunately grew legs and took off from there. From the way that she talked about James DeBarge in this documentary, I don't believe that there is any way that she would try to hurt that man. She did all in her power to help him, right? And keeping a child away from their father is one of the most hurtful things that you can do to a man. And so I don't think that she would inflict that level of pain on him. Um, and I don't believe it at all. And why I think that the rumor persists is because there's this saying in media that people run with the lie when the lie is more entertaining than the truth. And I think that that's where it begins and that's where it ends. It was a salacious story that was only furthered by the fact that Janet had gained weight during that time. But by her own admission, it was because she um, she had started birth control. And I guess back then a side effect of the birth control was that she would gain weight. So I don't really think there's a story here, but I'm glad that she addressed it because I don't think that you could really have a Janet documentary without addressing all the scandals um, or all the perceived scandals. And I think this was one of the, the, the biggest ones that she needed to put to bed and put to rest. Moving forward to the divide with Michael Jackson, um, Janet says it started with the Thriller album. I believe it. I think that... Um, it's a sort of common theme in the Jackson family in terms of the Jackson 5 separating from Joe Jackson, Michael Jackson separating from Joe Jackson, Janet Jackson separating from Joe Jackson, that there's a notion of needing to separate yourself away from your family to try to become who you are, right? And I think at that point when Michael was thrust into superstardom, unfortunately, the family aspect took a back seat to it. So I don't think it was anything done out of malicious intent or anything done out of a competition space. I just think that sometimes in order to become who you want to be, who you see yourself being, who the world wants you to be, and to a, to a lesser extent, you know, 
the actual vision that you have for yourself in there, you sort of have to separate yourself from your family. Um, and you hope that by the end of it, you can find your way back to them. You know, I feel like that's the goal sometimes that people in the entertainment business have. Now, on to the constant comparisons between the two. I think they were inevitable. Let's talk about it. Like, on the first hand, you both had the last name Jackson, right? So there's always going to be comparisons there. People like to categorize and compare things and try to put them into distinct boxes and, 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 and battle them against each other. It's just human nature, right? So the fact that y'all already started with the same last name meant that the comparison was already going to start from there. And then um, you add on to that, that Janet decided to go into the same business as Michael, right? Or to continue, you know, the natural extension of the family business, which would be a solo career on your own. There's going to be the same comparisons. It's the same thing that happens between, you know, the entertainment families, Beyonce versus Solange. They both went into the same um, music industry, although they do different types of music, right? Um, I don't ever think that it was a competition thing. And I'm glad that, you know, the people peripheral to Janet made that clear. It was never that she was in competition with MJ. It was more so that she was in competition with herself, trying to gain control of her life, trying to get away from her father and trying to assert who she was as a woman and an artist in her own right. So um, I really feel that the divide with MJ was just a byproduct of them both trying to get to the place that they saw for themselves. And continuing in this control theme, Janet took control of her life by firing her father and starting her control album. Um, the control album is really the framework of this whole documentary, if you think about it. Um, it's really her coming into her own as a woman and taking life by the reins on her own terms, you know? As she said, as she stated before, you know, she wanted to go to college and do business law, but she was thrust into this musical family, this this star power family and whatnot. And, you know, it's one of those things where just because you're good at something doesn't mean you enjoy it, Right. Um, but I think that she had to find a way to enjoy it on her own terms and make it her own, right? Because it was just something that she did before and not someone or not something that she was, right? So she said, listen, I am good at this. I have a talent at this. I want to give this another try. But in order to do that, it has to be my own decisions on my own terms. And I think that's what the Control album was. And I think that's why it resonated with people, especially people that were of the same age at the same time coming into their own as adults, trying to figure out where they fit in the world and how to make their own mark and separate themselves away from their parents as well or from what they've already um, or always known. Now on to the romance with Renee and the eventual marriage. It seemed to sort of come in concert with um, the success of the Control album, as well as the success of the Rhythm Nation um, period of Janet's life. And in contrast to her first marriage with James DeBarge, which I said was more of convenience, the marriage to Renee seems like more of circumstance, um, shared interest, and actual love, right? Um, and I think that's a very, very important distinction to make. Janet even said in her first marriage to James DeBarge, he did not give her a ring. There was no real you know, the pomp and circumstance of getting married, it wasn't really there, which is why I said it was a marriage of convenience, though that there was some puppy love there. So the marriage to Renee seems like more of a mature love. Um, and like I said, more of a marriage of shared interest and, um, and circumstance. I also think that it was um, important that they weren't in competing business with each other, right? Janet was in the music industry. Renee was more in the filmography, videographer industries. So they weren't in competition with each other. They were more so in concert with each other so that they could help each other create something worthwhile and move forward from there. So I think Janet was at a point where she was defining who she was. Renee was at a point where he was willing to support that and he saw the greatness that she could be and he wanted to bring her out of her shell. So I think that the fact that he documented everything because, you know, you want to look back on it one day was a very important thing to make in terms of saving your history, realizing your journey, and that sort of common thread of vision that has sort of weaved its way through the whole Janet Jackson story. So I don't really know. I'm not very well versed on the Renee and Janet marriage. I know it eventually dissolved. 
Um, I'm curious to know that if in the third and fourth parts, they'll talk about how that came to be, right? Because sometimes in these show business marriages, um, you know, they come together because of shared interest and commonalities and ability to support one another, but sometimes it becomes too much, right? Um, and it just becomes to the point where there's no separation between the person that I work with and the person that I'm married to, they become one in the same. So I'm interested to see if they'll investigate that further. But y'all, I think that's really all I wanted to say on these first two parts of the Janet documentary. Um, so if you liked what I said, please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. Follow me on all social media at Dad Damn Dasher. And until next time, y'all, I'll be here for parts three and four to see the scandals in terms of the Michael scandals, the Janet scandals, the rise, the eventual fall, and the rise again of Janet Jackson. Um, and so I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.